you had some extremely unique photographs, the most unique I've seen, in the fact that you found uh, some packs that the Germans left behind. Is that right? Yes, yes. That's yeah. where I got them German packs. I didn't take, I didn't take any off of uh, bodies. I didn't. Uh, that's something where I draw, draw, draw the line, and I wouldn't take any dead soldier's stuff out of his pockets. Or I wouldn't even look in his pockets. But if he had a wristwatch on it or a pocket watch, I'd take it. And everybody did. I mean, that was. Yeah, that was standard. Part but of there the was guys that uh, at that battle that I'm talking about. We had this when we we went through an awful battle that night, and we got trapped. And when I got the presidential citation, we were trapped, but that was a follow-up. We were trapped between the lines. After the plane bombed us, when we killed so many of our guys, and, you know, we only, there was me and another guy and a driver was always left on our half-track, and the other half-tracks got, you know, hit that way, too. And, but the, when we went in, to, the Germans closed the trap on us because that's where the breaking point was at our half track, because the Germans thought that that was the end of it when they moved on ahead of us, but we were coming along to beat heck on that road, and we got there just in time as they closed the trap, you know, for, for the rest of my outfit, and uh, that's when uh, machine guns just turned switched on like switching the light on. There were so many machine guns gone for tracer fire that. It just lit it up just like light, steady. That's how we got off the road and got down by the hedge road while they, in between the lines while they was doing all the shooting, you know, fighting, see. Uh, but uh, this man I was with, the next day when we caught up to our outfits and got in again, we were round, rounding up the, the second Panzer Division, Panzer Grenadiers, and some of them. Some of them, like for instance, the German half track, there was six guys in it, and there were six guys killed in the back. And the back door, the deal, the, the, the part of them was blown off their legs, you know, sitting in the furthest back. It was shell, taking a shell right in the back end of it. Well, they went and he was in there, rooting around, lifting up the bodies, trying to get them out of the way to get into their pockets. And they was falling down on him. I give him heck for it, but that's, you know, I see act like a grave robber. And uh, we were rounded up a bunch of them. And, and uh, looking back, everybody was rounding them up. Yeah. That must be where war changes people during war. I mean, on the, if you're walking down the street today and you saw somebody that died or whatever, you wouldn't even probably think about doing anything like that, but war, there are different rules, or a different reality to it. Now, do you remember where you found some of the cameras, or, or, or was it just one camera that you found? Because you have, that's why I said, you have some of the unique pictures, you have these, the, these uh, when you got them back and got them developed, the one I can, that stands out is some Germans. And they're in like a, a bunker, and it's Christmas. They have a little Christmas tree. Yeah, well, them were German films. They took them. They, they were, you know, took them. They was in France. And some of them, when they, the reason uh, we was moving up, and oh, I wanted to tell you this here. I left this out, but uh, there was a long trench, and it sort of snaked around, like you know, made a big sweep around and level out, but. Uh, the soldiers evidently had dropped their packs to go fight. So there was an all in perfect line around. These packs laying there. Nice packs. They had a, it's a German cavalry outfit. They had the cow skins, black and white hair on them, on the, on the, the sides of the packs. You know, it was still good, the nice packs. I'd like to have one. I took them home. But, so I opened up the packs, and a couple of them I managed to. I didn't have time to open up any more. And uh, I lo looked into them, and I grabbed the stuff. I seen the folder there, like well, one of them had a bunch of plastic and had a bunch of pictures in it. I still got the folder at home. It's made of some kind of a plastic. And that's how, you know, you come by them things. Now, the funny part of it is, in one 
house in St. Louis in one of them bags, I found a cigarette lighter. It was one of the old fashioned type, and you know, I mean, at the end it was modern. And I found, just found part of it, this German soldier's back. And then I was into a French house, not very far from there. By God, I found the other half of it, sitting on the mantel in the blood of the fireplace. The other half of it, and it was right on the same thing. Uh, so you, in, in any, so you found the lighter, you found some other stuff, you found camera? Well, the cameras is, I, I, uh, we, we collected them. They didn't, we didn't get them right from the soldiers. Because when we would come into town, the people, uh, if I, I used to tell them that uh, to bring in all guns and cameras, and field glasses, you know, and all stuff like that. And they would bring them, bring them in. I mean, because otherwise they'd be, uh, well, they might, I doubted very much if they'd use them against you or not, anything like that. But I got a, I got the best camera that was made at that time. It was a Roloflex. And it was the one you look down the top of it and you could see a real good view in it. And it was, a lot of guys were after that camera. I finally sold it for six hundred and fifty dollars to another guy in my outfit, but it was the best one. It's a Roloflex camera, and that was the best one. It had a, a best, one of the best Zeiss lenses on it, and uh, and everything. And that's what these field glasses had: Zeiss, Zeiss and Yenna lens on them. But we took them. They were the field glasses. Were I took them off of. Uh, uh, artillerymen, German when they over on the artillery, you know. They had, that's where I got them. That one pair was an officer's thing. But they, they served me uh, real well, the field glasses, the ones I wore. Yeah. So the, with, the, with the camera, you then finished, there was film in it, you finished the roll of film and brought that film all the way back home with you, or? Uh, no. I don't know how I did it. I don't remember now, but I left four rolls of film that I'd taken in Holland from a guy who was supposed to get them developed for me, and I gave him the money, a Dutchman, but I didn't get back to get them. And I often think if there was some way I could get a hold of that guy and get my four rolls of films, that I'd pay him for it, you know. It was just an ordinary citizen in Galeen, uh, no, uh, Heerlen, Holland. Uh, Heerlen. And uh, I'd like to, though they was, I had good pictures in that time. I had Wagner war pictures and all, all kinds of stuff I took to manage just try to take right where he, he was fighting and stuff like that, you know. Well, you have a lot of um, real good uh, average, I mean, day in the life of photos where you really see these people that were your friends, were your people you served with. And, and, uh, this uh, this deal, when I got into the, uh, you know, they put me off in that in the wrong place, you know, when I went in there with a German uh, uh, Gestapo meeting, you know. This is uh, when they, they took you in the jeep. You were they were supposed to drop you off, and you were supposed to look for where the tanks were going. Yeah, I was supposed to d stop the tanks and disperse them when they moved up along this road. And then, of course, we took the wrong road. We, that, at that point where we took a 90 degree turn to the right is where we should have stopped because there was a tree line up ahead of us and we were supposed to stop there because we knew the Germans would be in the tree line, see, around the town. And that's when he dropped us off about a mile to the right of that. And that's when I went in and barged in on that Gestapo meeting. Uh, that was, he was just lucky. I was just lucky there. Yeah. And then and kissing like Francis. Uh, yeah. And uh, we captured a large medical supply in, in the theater east of the Rhine. There's all kinds of medicine, big, two huge, big safes there. And we set up a machine gun. In the door, right during the doorway, 
until we could turn it over to the MPs, you know. And that was uh, uh, German medical supplies? Yeah. And then, like I said, we that one place, that we liberated Wolfenbuttel, death camp. They used my suggestion to use kerosene with paint brushes to kill bed bugs and lice in corners of the iron folding beds. And, uh, and uh, I think from then on, that's what they used the rest of the war, probably. Then in France there, they had the uh, trenches, you know, the, for the gun emplacements up on the hill. They had trenches that wind around. They'd come together. There would be big barrels. They sort of oblong, just like egg shaped, and uh, they were full of hard cider. And on, on usually on the board there with some nails on it, there'd be the uh, long handled dippers, you know, to drink out, and they'd be hanging there. And the same ones the Germans drank out, we drank out of, and. Drink that hard cider, boy, I'll tell you. They had this, uh, it's sour. You don't, want, you don't want to drink too much of it. It'd make it, you sick. Is it strong besides sour? Or no, it's, 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 just, it's just plain old sour. I mean, warm you up when it goes right down, you know, but the guys get sick on it. And after I found out, I seen it get sick on it. Boy, I drank a little bit of it, not much of it, you know. Well, if you get thirsty, you would take a good bite of it. That's uh, Adolf and going through your your photos and materials you had. He he wanted me to ask you if if. Uh, if you remember these words, if these are familiar to you, and I guess it's written in some of the material you have, but underneath the lantern by the very gate, darling, I remember the way you used to wait. Twas there that you whispered tenderly that you loved me. You'd always be my lily of the lamplight, my own little, my own lily Marlene. Yeah. Where does that? Where did Sam? Well, that was a German war song that they sang for the German soldiers. Uh, just like our songs, you know, we come up, that was the German song, uh, Leslie Marlene. And uh, we would turn on the radio sometime, and we would, it was supposed to be against the rules, but we had radios on the half tracks and good ones, and so we'd pull in the night evenings, sometimes we'd, when things were quiet, we'd channel in on the uh, on that German station and this, we had this propaganda girl in it and she would be on and she would sing Lily Marlene to us and she'd sit, tell us you know the American soldiers now and so and program or and she'd sing Lily Marlene and it was a sort of a Sentimental, it, it applied to us the same way. <laughs> yeah, same way, you know. So I got it at home anyway. I got the Lily Marine. So, that, so she was, uh, uh, in a way, trying to break your morale or make you sad. Make you right. Happy. Yeah. That's that's mainly what it was. Some, you know. But, Guy gets the guys get homesick. I didn't get that way, but I liked the, the song. Did make me sad and stuff. In Berlin, we were there, and Mickey Rooney come in to this big German theater. Uh, it was a bombed a little bit up above on the roof. Had a big dome up there, and uh, so the soldiers. It was for the soldiers that that were in, signed in Berlin for the Potsdam Conference. So they, I mean, a lot of guys went to it, and I went to it. And I got in there. I got a little bit late, so I didn't get no seat. But everything was filled up, and I was back at the back end there, and there was a leak in the roof. So it was leaking rain, and it was leaking down on me there. So I 
finally moved and I walked out into the lobby and there was a woman out there. She was a blonde woman, a nice looking woman. And she talked to me and she told me that she was the one that sang Lily Marley. She said she was the one that made it famous, the song. And uh, so I took her down along the side of the aisle of the seats, you know, like all the way down to the to the front end where the where the people were, you know, where the steps goes up on the stage and stuff on each side. And there's some American soldiers there that were helping administer the program. And I I told them about her and turned her over to them there, you know. I don't know if she ever managed to get a song or sing a song or of course. She left, you know. Uh, and she was American or German? She was German. 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 Yeah. So did she sing Lily Marlene with a German accent, or was she? Uh, no, she'd sing it just like a, just, just like a. Wow. English, that's what in perfect English. And, and Mickey Rooney was there too. You say is that right? Yeah. yeah so was it, was this like a. The U.S. saw, I mean, this is probably... Yeah, one of them more war deals, you know. He was quite a guy, you know. And I'd, if I'd have had a seat, I'd probably stayed there till the end of the deal when it was, was raining at the day. And it was dark, and I had to get along. I had to go for quite a ways there. I couldn't get back to... I was with another guy, but... Get back with me. Uh, this... Uh, I told you about the Russians in the camps, uh, these here worker camps, you know. Yeah, you uh, said they were worse than the... Well, we had our hands full because when the Russians had come in with trucks with uh, uniforms, instead of t bringing in food and medical supplies, you know, they would get pretty big-headed, you know. We had to round them up in one place, we rounded them up and uh, all the bicycles they had in camp. But they, they, well, you know, you can't let them turn them loose and let them pillage and rob the country. You're going to have more tur turmoil there, see. So we went and picked up the stuff that they'd bring into the camps, loaded in trucks, take it out to the center where the military government people, and they'd call in give the people their bicycles back and go to come in and identify their bicycles, stuff like that. In one case, we was at Stad Holdendorf. We got a, well, some information in about the, uh, there was a camp right nearby there. We got an information in there was a uh, railroad cars loaded with furs and valuables come in. So we checked. I went up, checked, and get the numbers of the cars. And I, there was five box cars, four or five box cars, up in the siding up there at this railroad station. And they were they were the ones they were after. And so we had to secure them right away because he figured that somebody who said he was gonna make a raid up, raid on them and get them and all them off, I guess. But there was more to it than that. I didn't find out until later on, but I, I went up there and me and another guy, and we, we set up a machine gun right in the cupola of the radio, of the, uh, the station, and uh, sandbagged it. And then I, while well, he was there at the machine, I went down along with I had a little crowbar, and I went down and I broke the seals off the cars, and I climbed up in them. I was going to see what in the hell was in them, you know. Well, they was loaded with hides up by the by the doors, and I'd get as many hides, uh, but they stunk, you know, and they had a lot of meat on them and fat, you know, and they all kinds of goat skins and cow skins and pig skins and everything like that, you know, up there, and they'd be just loaded with them. They all smelt the same, but that was the purpose of the deal. I, I told them, I said, them thing is just loaded up with old animal skins, I said, hides. They ain't nothing valuable there, but the NPs come in, and then they took them off our hands, see. And uh, so then we got a rumor back later on that there was 
A lot of stuff in there hidden back in behind that bagels. Some of that there war booty, you know, probably gold and everything, see. I kicked myself for not looking better. <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to pack it, but I, you know, that. So they put the old stinky hides to deter you. To yeah, say, oh, yeah, yeah, right. God, you had no place to put them. No one should have cleaned one side or the other, you know. But. <laughs> and was that the Germans' booty or was that the Russian booty? It was the Germans. Germans. Yeah, they were hiding them. Hiding their stuff. And, uh, who, uh, um, did, did you have a, a, a girlfriend back home during the war? Me. Or did you write anybody back home? I wasn't really interested in, in girls. I think I wrote one girl, but I don't remember now what her name was. Did you write, did you write your mom and dad? Yes. Did they, did they write you back? I mean, yeah, I didn't, didn't they, they were, yeah, I got letters back. It's in one of them albums, I think. I don't know if I took, I think I, I, think I left that in there. They, they get, yeah, I found all the letters. My mother, my mother passed away here, I'll be two years in July, and she had a bunch of stuff that I got, the letters I wrote and stuff. But of course, a lot of the stuff I didn't remember, what, and sent some stuff to them. And, watch or something, and I remember I can't remember the watch now. But I'd send a bunch of other stuff, I'd tell them. That, uh, we had a deal one time. Uh, I was watching, was up in Germany, further about in the middle of Germany, you know, between the Rhine and Berlin. And we captured this town, and and I was watching. I had about forty prisoners out in in the theater, sitting out in the middle of the thing, and I hadn't shaken them down yet. We shook them down for for guns, good, you know, pistols, small ones. And I was kind of thought I'd better do that, but then I postponed it. I was just getting ready to do. It. Went down there, and the uh, I was going to watch them till. Uh, MPs come by with the trucks and picked them up. By gosh, my buddy come in. That's that little guy that was a scout with me and he's the one that always liked to loot everything, you know. And he says, Wonko, Wonko, he says, come here, I'll show you something. And I said, okay, I said, I'm watching these prisoners here. I said, well, he said, well, you can look out the window. So I went out and looked out the window and he said, look over there. And on this hill, sitting about a mile away, was a beautiful big castle. You know, a nice one. And it wasn't tore up. And so, he says, let's go over and look that thing over. I said, well, what about, was it, has it been captured yet? No, no, he says. And I said, well, I got to get somebody to take care of these prisoners here. So I talked to a couple of guys that are standing around a couple of my outfit. I said, you guys, you want to take watch these prisoners till the MPs pick them up? No. Nah. I said, well, I just want to tell you. I said, you want to watch them because I haven't, I haven't shook them down yet. I mean, they ain't been in there in a while. There'd be some watches on them, you know. So, yeah, we'll take care. We'll watch them. I don't know, make sure they watch them. Yeah, we're fine. They, so, so. I said, how are we going to get over there? I went out the door and I was looking over my field glasses at the castle. Same field glass I always used. And he says, oh yeah, that's a pretty good looking castle. There's a one shell crater right down next to the basement door, the lower level, right down the ground level. It was a nice big shell crater right on the left of the door. And it had one of them old oval top doors, like a dungeon had, you know. I said, well, it, we can always get in that hole right there. Yeah, he says, well, I said, well what are we going to do here now? He said, well, i got a motorcycle right out here. And he, he was a relief motorcycle rider. So he, he rode part of the time, and he, Harley Davidson, and he said, I'll get the sickle. Well, we took off on you know, that sickle and got over there. We parked on this ridge right below the castle. There was a darn river running through there. 
and, it, and the, the river bus, they broke the bridge in it, and the bridge is right down like this. And there was water on the stretch of there. Boy, it was black like the water. It looked like it was pretty deep, see? We had to jump across that. Well, it was sloping down one way and sloping up the other way, and we had to jump across it. And you couldn't get the proper balance there, you know, to jump across that. Boy, I said, I don't know if we can make that or not. Oh, yeah, I can walk. But you got longer legs than I have, Waco. You try it first. He says, so, okay, I got down, and boy, I made it on the other side, jumping across that water, and the water was moving, you know. And it was pretty deep, because you could tell by the shape of the concrete where it went down in there. A lot of water got across it, and then he, by gosh, he jumped and he made it. So he got over on the other side and left the motorcycle sitting right up there. Nobody ever bothered GI equipment. Nothing, nobody touched it. Another GI wouldn't touch it, you know. And I got over there, and I looked up at the castle, and looked it over real good. And by then, there had come an oh, advanced unit of infantry had moved up right by us there. And this lieutenant, this lieutenant platoon leader was lining them up. Come on, you guys here are taking the platoon. And the whole platoon was going to go up and take that castle. castle, castle. Up there, he was telling them he was going to go up the hillside where the main road went to the right. And then evidently it turned to the left after it got up on top of the ridge and then went over to the castle. And it continued on also to the next town, the little village. And uh, so... I said, well, boy, we better get going. I said, we got to beat them infantry up there. I said, you sure? When did they quit? They quit. There hadn't been no fire from it for a while. He says, and they didn't want to tear it up with the artillery. I said, well, let's go. I said, I've climbed them hills before. I said, I, I used to climb pretty steep ones in Colorado. I says, and uh, uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. He says, how are we going to do this? I says, well, if you'll look, I have my glasses. There's some flowers growing along below that castle on that hillside. I said, so that's their garden. I said, you can see, look like there's some concrete seats there. You know, how they make them. And then, and then the trail winds around, you know, all over. And I says, by gosh, they come out of the castle and they come down there, have a nice little walk around there. And I said, I can see them flowers down. And as far down as you can see the flowers, you know darn well that'll probably be where the, uh, where the pathway ends. <clears throat> I said, well, don't go down, when we started going up, I said, don't go down these, the bottom of these draws, just stay on the higher part of the ridges, and we'll work up, and we'll take that one. I said, we'll go up. We didn't know that the other outfit was back there, and they was watching us. The rest of the captain and the whole works watching us with their field glasses, you know. So we circled around, and boy, we went up there, and we clumb up there, and by gosh, we got to the door, and it, it, sure enough, it was barred inside. We couldn't get through the door, so we climbed up through that shell crater and got in the bottom of the castle. And boy, we was the first Americans in there, there was no question about that. And we went into the first room to the left, and it was full of uh, had, uh, uh, liquors and straw mats, you know, bottles, box all, all over, uh, cases of them, you know. And then these big, uh, huge paintings, beautiful frames, they were probably a fortune in paintings right there, probably Rembrandts and everything down there, and had them safe storage down the bottom, see. Well, there was nothing there we could pack. So we started up the stairs and got there. there was, the room on the right had a bunch of rotten cabbage in it, I remember that. <clears throat> and we started up the stairs, and his, the buddy said, well, we got to take something up there. He, I'm just meant this is a small box of oh, this whiskey I had about about all oh, six or eight bottles in it. He put it on his shoulder, and then he started up the stairs and he slipped and he dropped it and busted him right there on the stairs. I, I said just leave it there. I don't want to that. And we got up the main floor, of the castle, and believe me, it was beautiful up there. It was like uh, everything was in panel wood and all kinds of stuff elaborate on the walls. The baron that was in the castle, if it was a baron, imagine it probably was, and in the in the room, like a reception part of the house, was a stack with high boxes in there. They was all nailed up like they just getting ready to ship them out and they got and they were just full of uh of uh, uh pistols, antique derringers every kind, 
And some of them were in small boxes, and they was encrusted with silver and gold, you know. Beautiful. And I was trying to get something to pry open the boxes, you know, and to get the boards off and look in them and stuff. And, of course, we couldn't pack. And then there was a big, on top of that, there was a big, long glass case in there in the main room there, in the, full of canes. And they all was encrusted precious stones on the, on the ends of them. Boy, just a fortune right there, you know. And all ours. And hell, we couldn't pack it, but we couldn't carry it, see. And so I went and I managed to get a couple of hill of the things off the, the the canes and the knobs. And I never, they finally, at the end of the war, guy stole them from me, all of them. So I did. But anyway, he got a box of dueling pistols. They were inlaid with gold and silver. And they were, and they were just short ones. They weren't over, oh, 10, 10 inches long or 12. A beautiful, well, it wasn't 12. I know they'd be eight and 10 inches. They were just miniatures. Oh, they were, it cost a fortune anyway if you bought them. You got them with it. And I said, well, this is, I was waiting for the other infantry to come up the other way and we'd be there at the castle to welcome them, see. And that platoon, my gosh, he never showed up. And I was standing, I was watching. And there must be somebody up here, some other human. And I was watching, uh, there was over across the way, the courtyard, big courtyard there, and there was a big gate there on the right side of the, this building, little two-story building there, old-fashioned building. So I got up and I was looking, and I got it right up the edge of the window, and I, and I just started watching that house for any movement. So I seen the curtain move just a little bit upstairs. You know, I knew somebody was looking and watching over there at the house. So I says, uh, well, don't move around. I told my buddy, I says, don't move around in front of the windows. I said, there's somebody watching us now over across the courtyard here. I said, we'll just slip around the side, went around the side of the wall and come along up that court building. We'll just say, find out who that is. So we slipped around there and I bangs on the door down below there and no sign of anything. So I says, well, we can throw a grenade here. We'll blow this door open. Hand grenade, had plenty of them. And so we went and I said, oh, I think, I said, just let it, he knows, whoever's up there, they know we're da down here. And I said, let's get back ways and we pointed at the window where the, we had seen the curtain move just like that. And by gosh, he answered us. I hollered, hey, hey. And he answered us. And I come down there, he was the caretaker. Well, he asked, uh, well, I, we asked him where the castle jewels was. You know, something small or worth or something and easy to carry, you know. But he, uh, he says the Baron took them all with him when he left. That's the didn't take anything else. Oh, we had to get back anyway. And then the guys have been watching us. But we didn't know it at the time. They've been watching us climb up that hill and go in there. <laughs> they was waiting, waiting to hear some shooting up there. See, we, we disappointed them. <laughs> and we come around to the main road that went up to the castle up on top of the ridge and got down to where the forks. Well, we seen, we heard some fire down there. Hadn't been machine gun fire. It sounded like it was way off, but it was down there. And we got down there to where the road fork and one went on straight, uh, went where if you took a right, you went right down the hill where the infantry had come up. If you took a left, it'd go down the hill to, to that little village there. But anyway, we took a right and went down there. We never did run into any infantry. But we did see a lot of empty casings, you know, uh, machine gun casings and rifle casings there. It was the same size, you know, there. I don't know what ever happened to that infantry. It was another infantry outfit, but we beat them up there anyway. But we didn't. We sure didn't carry off anything. We had just the pistols here. We had, well, we got back the outfit up there, and the guys are and it's sort of sheepish act around. They didn't say, you know, they was watching. So where you guys been? I was just doing some scouting. That's all we do. We scouts. We we scout. Let's scout this or let's scout that. See, and we 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 take off. You know, and get. Uh, it was a uh, 
That was the best part of being a scout. He was pretty independent. I was going to say, you, you uh, started out as this independent kid out doing your, your skinning and all that, and, and the service, even though the discipline and everything was there, you still were out by yourself to a certain extent. I mean, yeah, you and, yeah. Now, what you talked about your buddy, the guy that, that when you got put a, a, across the line and ran into the SS and all that, did you travel with this same scout all the time? Uh, he popped up with me all the time. I didn't ask for him, but that was the way the assignment was. His name was Fiscaldo. Fiscaldo? Yeah. And he, he but he, he liked me, I think, for uh, good reinforcement purposes. He knew that, you know, and he was sick with me, you know. <laughs> he, he would get in trouble and you'd get him out, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah, he was. Did, did, did he make it through the war? Yeah, he made it through the war because I remember. I remember the last thing in the town I picked uh, when we left Berlin. I was with Major Goodman, and we went to down by Frankfurt to a town, a village back up in the mountains called Sterbfritz. And he told me, "Well, you go find the billets for the troops, and I'll I'll look for the officers' billets." And we just move in where we see a practical place and tell the Germans that they got to move out, you know. Well, I picked a schoolhouse. It had a wall around it, good good place for the guys. And then I picked out the, the school principal's office. There was a big stove in there and everything like that and a refrigerator. So we could have, uh, you know, a housekeeping things. So I moved in and had a couple of cots moved in from my buddies and me. And, and when they come in, I had a I was all set up. The other guys, they had to sleep with blankets on the floors or but they didn't complain. That's what they have been doing. There's a lot of protection there, you know. And, and uh, so, and, and he was there, and he had a, he was sleeping on the floor, though, in one of the rooms. And what happened, he had a little puppy there, a little dog, I mean, a cute little puppy. And one of these guys that, uh, you know, that didn't, he let the war get a hold of him, you know what I mean? <clears throat> and uh, which I didn't. And he uh, he shot him, he shot him, the little dog, and he just nicked him. <clears throat> well, it, it was Fiscaldo's dog. He he collected him, little puppy, and he'd sleep with him down there. And, but he he had flies would be flying around his wound. I think. I hope he finally. <coughs> <coughs> get him, put some medicine on him or something because I finally lost track of him. Yeah, but that's where he was, I know. I had more points than he did, so I left, I think. Uh, for did you keep one of the pets? Uh, no. Mm -mm. Yeah. Pets this was after the war, so he picked him up. And, and, uh, had a sort of a peaceful place up there. We had a lot of ammunition they wanted to get rid of, shoot it up, and we'd get up and we'd shoot up our ammunition. And one place we had, a hill went down and we th th threw a lot of grenades over it, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't that interesting, but just the way to burn up the ammunition, you know. Just out. Yeah. Grenade after grenade, like throwing firecrackers. Yeah. Uh. But uh, we had, uh, and the, we had the last big battle we had was in a tavern in the Hassel building. <laughs> uh, I remember that. We captured that town. We liberated it, you know. And when when they first started to let give some guys some R and R. He asked me, he said, well, go, we can drive a truck. I said, yeah. Why don't you take uh, uh, these guys over? I'll have a, you know, call in guys from different companies. I guess I was in regimental headquarters, see. And we'll get the guys together and be interested in getting some leave, R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. About three to five days back in, in Belgium, Hasselt. It wasn't tore up much. You know, it was pretty the town was in good shape. I said, well, 
I said, I ain't got nothing else to do. I said, sure, I'll, I'll take him back. Well, I've made I don't know how many trips back there, you know. And then even when I got up to Berlin, it's in Berlin I even went back with him, took him back. We'd get watches, we'd buy watches back there for, oh, around 50 bucks from the Belgians. And then uh, sell them to the Russians in Berlin black market there, and we'd get $350 out of them. Three hundred to three hundred fifteen bucks out of them. But uh, we we got it into a little scrape that way. There was always something that when you had something good, you'd have a scrape. What happened is I bought two watches of this special kind. They looked the same way, and I asked him how many jewels there was in it. You know, all oh, their jewels. You I opened it up. I opened it up, and sure enough, you know, there's. I think I counted out so many jewels, and then you double that on each end of the little wheels in there. You know, there's a jewel, like a bearing. So you double it, and they're usually root red jewels. And we, uh, so I had two of them, and we was up there in Berlin selling them. Some other guys would give us some money too. We bought some watches for some of the other guys. We were selling ours, and we was young. We was with my, my buddy was driving a truck, but they didn't have no muffler on it. Two and a half ton, you know how noisy that'd be. And I was sitting up in the front seat, and this is uh, with him. We'd seen these Russians up there. We was way off in, in the Rus deep into the Russian territory, you know. <clears throat> these guys were gathered all around the, the truck on the right side, where I had a shoe box there, and I put the money in it, and uh, a little cardboard box. Anyway, I. The guy asked me how many jewels there's in this Russian. He knew it was smart enough to know, you know. But, and I'd sold one, the one already. And I says, yeah, and they were both the same. And I remember this watchmaker, he told me, he says, oh, it's the same. And he had trouble getting the back off. And I was in a hurry. And I said, that's okay, it's the same. It looked the same on the face, dark face with the second hand. That's what the Russian's like, you know. And uh, so he... Uh, I told the Russian, you know, and by gosh, he pried that back off just like that, and there wasn't a jewel in that thing. And I didn't know that myself. <coughs> and boy, they got mad. There were about a whole bunch of them around, about 12 of them around there, and the guys were all crowding up to get up to the front, you know. And they, he got mad, and they started call, uh, calling us Jews, you know. Everybody seems to know about Jews all over the world, you know. He called us. Uh, Jews and uh, and I told my buddy I says you know we better we better get out of here fast I said because these guys are going to take the watches and the money of the whole works I says well this guy right here couldn't under couldn't tell what I was talking about that guy right here he got up on the fender on on the running board and stand I said what I'm going to do he, the truck was idling I says you uh, just get ready, and I'll give up. I'll, I'll swing up here, and I'll put my foot right in his chest, and I'll push him away away from the truck. I did knock him away from the truck. I put, push, and then you gun her up and get out of here fast before they started shooting at us. You know. Well, they didn't shoot us, and we got down through this sort of a big opening, and we just gone to be the heck and. Around the corner we come. We still in Russian territory. They could catch us good. Around the corner we come, and here was a whole company of uh, these uh, uh, Russian. What, uh, what do you call them? The uh, oh, they're like the uh, Mongols, Mongol troops. They, here they come around, all fixed with their rifle and their bayonets, and boy, out there we almost plowed into the whole bunch of them. And there was a lot of street wasn't too wide there. Boy, we went around there, and they were just scattered. We didn't hear any shots behind us, and I told them, boy, we just get back to the American side fast. You know, we did. <laughs> you know, in Berlin, uh, the Russian soldiers killed some of our men, you know. I probably mentioned that. One of them was a friend of mine, his name was Sammy Santora. 
and uh, we let them get by with all this stuff because they said they didn't want to disillusion the American people by uh, the hostile moves from the Russians, you know. So they kept all that stuff secret, just like they're keeping a lot of stuff secret from us now. And that's a regular pattern. Yeah. That, who was your, you, you said um, they got a, a, a friend of yours, Sammy? Sammy Santora, yeah. The Russian sister. They beat him to death. And I had to tell his girl that he was going to marry. It was a German go girl. I, I, the t guys asked me, his buddy, good buddies, that you know, I didn't associate with him all the time, but I liked him and I'd see him once in a while all the time. They, they asked me if I would, on one of my trips to Bel Belgium, that I'd swing by Stadt Hollendorf, Germany, <coughs> and, and tell his girlfriend that he was killed. So they, they'd planned on getting married. Yeah. So I had to do that, I hated to do it, but that's what all this war is all about, heartaches, you know, a lot of heartaches. Did you, did you have a best friend that traveled with you all the time through the war? I started out with him, and I lost him in, in Omaha, uh, uh, St. Lo, and that was it. Mm -hmm. I had a couple other buddies, they both named Frank. My name was Frank, too. So the Germans called us Grosse Frank, was me, Mitte Frank, Middle Frank, you know, the other guy, and Kleine Frank was another, the other one. He was a little guy from Brooklyn. He, uh, when he first went in my outfit, I seen him crying, and I went up and consoled him a little bit. <coughs> what <coughs> happened, we was, Assigned to the headquarters in France, we signed to the headquarters there <coughs> before the St. Louis breakthrough. They wanted some infantry up there for guards around their command post and around their officers' staff meetings and everything, you know. So they called us up there. And that was it. They signed us, signed us up there. Well, he was a in the, in the, working in the kitchen for the division commander, see. And this is where it was, division command. And, and so one day we was out there, and they, this is before they got rid of us. They said they get rid of us because they felt safer with the Germans than they did with us. I mean, they, they, they wanted the infantry, but we were a hard-dosed infantry, you know what I mean? And uh, I could I'd stop the officers for identification. And the officers have to tell me, of course, I didn't know. I just listened to orders. I, he says, I come in here this morning. Do I have to have my identification again? I said, yep, yes, that's orders, sir. And I'd get them. They got sort of jumpy with us up there with the guards and hand grenades hanging over us, all over our belts. And, and, and so they, they says, well, they feel, they'd feel more at ease if we, we, with the Germans, they would us up there. So they let us go back to our outfit. See, they didn't ask for us up there anymore. But the uh, the Frankie was there. I remember that day we had a meeting. The general command, you know, the general was up there, and the general told him, "I know." He says, "You men are having a tough time here." He says, "You got these darn potatoes to peel, and he says these pots and pans, all of them to wash." And he says, "There's an endless endless supply of these pots." pots and pans, and he act like he was sympathizing with these guys. And he says, who, who is tired of doing this stuff, doing all these scrubbing pans? Raise your hands, he said. Well, these guys raised their hands, and I don't know how many raised them up, but this one guy I knew raised his hands up. He's not very far from me there, Stan. And it was, his name was Frankie. He says, okay, sergeant, you sergeants go out there and get these guys' names here. And boy, they was all eager to get their name, but then, then he finished up what he said. And we'll send these boys on down to the infantry. Oh my God, them guys are just like giving them a death warrant, you know. He was trying to pull their hands back down, you know, they got caught. So he was one of them, right? So it wasn't long I recognized the face, and I, it wasn't long after that, and, here I seen this guy with his head in his hands down there, and I was sitting down on a 
block of wood there. He says, I said, what's wrong, soldier? I said, what, uh, what, something happened? Don't you feel good? He says, oh, oh. Uh, he says, I'm, I'm in the infantry. And he says, I probably won't last long now. And he says, I told him, I says, well, and I wanted to console him a little bit, you know. I says, look at me. I says, I've been here 10 days, and I'm still alive. And I says, you, you, you just don't worry about it. I says, I don't worry about it. And by gosh, he finished the whole war up. I didn't associate him with him, not because our, our assignments were different. He, you know. And uh, we had an occasion one time you know, where he was there that the command post had moved into a bad situation up on a high on the hill at the the regimental command post, and, uh, and the Germans had been shelling with uh, heavy guns, railroad guns and stuff, you know, and, and then a report come down through that the German had counterattacked it again, and uh, they were advancing further up the little valley like the hill here, and they expected that the command post was in extreme danger getting overrun. Well, I happened to be there at that time and not be on any assignments or anything. Just dig a trench around the perimeter and get the, and get the machine, get set up machine guns. Of course, we knew what to do. We'd, and boy, we went to digging, picks and shovels. It wasn't just small stuff. We took the picks and shovels off the half tracks. Every one of them had one on, you know. And boy, we would dig and dig every place we dug right around the edge of this little sort of a field below where the that they had their set up there with a bunch of camouflage nets over it, right up behind us. And we dug it, and it was in that blue shale, like clay shale stuff. Oh, it, you, you could tell it. The only thing you could dig to beat that can only get a shovel full out. And we wasn't making no progress. I said, boy, there's a better way than that to get this here over done. I said, we got to get these in, and they was after us to get them machine guns in position. So I says, get the de demolitions man. I'll talk to him right here. We'll get him over here. We got him over and boy, he was all eager to help, you know. And I said, we got to dig some trenches. We need some help there. And I says, oh. well, he says, I got just the stuff for that. So we bore a bunch of holes as much as we could down in TNT, you know. And so we got her all set up and and we was going to have a quick, we did make a good bridge, only it was just individual holes. They didn't connect. Right? <laughs> he set the charge off no longer. And believe me, that shale come right up. And it went right up in the air. And it seemed like it was just set just proper. And it come right down on the command post, on, on, a, on the camouflage nets, you know. And boy, they all fell, fall over. The nets are all banged out. They just loaded up with that flat piece of the shale. It wouldn't go through the nets, you know. And boy, we had to do do fast. And we, I dashed around there and they looked at me. Officers come crawling up from underneath it and there, stuff. One of them says, <clears throat> "Boy, he says that's big stuff." He says, a "Railroad gun, isn't that Waco? Is that a railroad gun?" I said, "Yeah, that's a railroad gun." <laughs> I totally in a railroad gun. Boy, just let it go at that. I'll tell you, never say anything more about it. It's a railroad gun. So <laughs> <laughs> we'd have a few laughs once in a while, you know. And one time, the one of our men, one of the guys, sold her down in Berlin. He was walking down the street, and there's American tanks sitting there which he dispersed sometimes. He'd put about tanks, just let the Russians know we was active. The tank was sitting there, and they went by there. And the guy just heard from it secondhand. I heard then it was all over. You hear it all over. But anyway, these Russian, Russian soldiers were looking at the tank, and these guys walk, were walking by down the street, and he stopped and started talking to, to the Russian soldiers. And the, uh, the Amer uh, American soldiers were walking down the street. The other guys were inside the tank. And the guy was walking down the street. The, the two GIs 
And the Russians had all kinds of money, and they sold them the tank, the American tank. And boy, they paid them then. They thought, and all that terrible invasion marks that the Russians had stamped up by the barrel load or wagon load. And uh, so they was claiming they had a little asshole over it and to get that unsettled because they thought they bought that tank. And when these guys come out of there, <laughs> they changed hands, changed ownership. <laughs> that was another thing. Gee, I didn't pull anything, you know. I'd... Good scene trying to bring that home. You know, we were the, uh, one of the first units we, to break through the Siegfried Line. You, you remember the Siegfried Line? And we, it was, uh, I was with a lieutenant colonel. He was a liaison officer, so I'd be with him. I was assigned to him and he'd come down. That was my first assignment with him. And he says, well, I told him my name was Waco. I said, it's easy. Well, that's, he went on, he called me Waco. And he says, well, I said, what, what do we got up going? He says, well, what I want to do and he says, you, when we, just before the attack started, we, there were some barns and sheds and a few houses there in Ubach, U-B-A-C-H, right in the town, sacred line. And so we're going to break through, we're going to start to attack. And so, but I want you to stay right here. And he says, there's a haystack right over there. Part of the hay was in the barn, part of it outside the barn. Stay there and don't move, because I'm going to need you bad. And I says, well, okay. And I thought, well, boy, in the middle of the night, he's going to need me, and that'll be, we'll be gone, you know. And then God started attacking the city for lying, and all kinds of ruckus has gone on, you know. I have it back there, pretty safe spot though, between me and the Germans in the, in the line itself, the secret of tanks, tank obstacles and everything was this big A stack. I just buried underneath there. Good, I could, oh man, it was sort of a drizzle and rain on top of, and I just inside the barn a little bit. They, boy, boy, that was perfect. I thought, just stay here. And I waited for a while, for you know, for quite a, quite a while. Be, I figured he'd be after me. My God, he never showed up. And I'll tell you the thing, when it lasted that day, and then that night, there was, things slacked off a little bit. And by then, the, we'd broken through the line and, and started dispersing, you know, to the right and the left after we went through the tank traps. And of course, uh, there's a lot of fighting to do on that. We had to go up and down that line for a long time because then big pillboxes was there. We had to blow them up and capture them. Anyway, about long towards morning, but I wasn't, God, it must have been 10 o'clock. He says, well, Waco, <clears throat> we got to try to locate the 30th, it was a, <clears throat> I'm sure it was the 30th Infantry, not the 29th, Infantry Command Post. As there's some place down south on the right flank. <clears throat> so he said, uh, let's go. So we took off, and we got down there, and we were moving right along, just like I didn't like that trouble with the officers. They weren't cautious enough when you start getting up. We're right, right in the middle of the front line, no man's line. You, you got to be approach that carefully so you know where the Germans are. You know, we were barreling down there, and boy, all of a sudden the guys running across the street, and the machine guns gone right there. He's right in the middle of it, and I didn't wait for no more orders. I just turned it off to the right into a sort of a courtyard there behind a big farm and I pulled right around to the right and just a few feet behind the wall and I stopped. I said, boy, this is as far as we're going. Here, he says, and then the Germans opened up at us with the artillery shells, so they kept coming in. Well, there's a tank retriever right back over on the left in the vacant lot. <coughs> I could see him over there and, and uh, so I, the colonel, he took off out in the street, and I took off to the right. There was a big farmhouse there, and I went in the farmhouse and went right downstairs in the damn basement until so like, the shelling was over. But they, the shell never did get over, and that building was just, when I finally up and down a few times, I was up and down to, 
check, but every time I'd come up, the, the shells would start falling again, and I'd move back down there. Finally, there was no house there no more. And I heard the colonel hollering, uh, Walco, Walco, up there hollering. I says, Colonel, come on down here. It's safe down here. It's pretty safe down here. Come on down. No, he says, it's safer up here. He got another place. Well, he found the command post, and it was in a gun emplacement, and the gun was pointing towards our way. It was on rails, and so it could only shoot our, back our way. It was a German position, see. Anyway, we made it out of that. We just got out, and, we, and the half track on our right got hit with a shell and killed six men right now, like that, in, in the thing. And we, but previous to that, we we had to uh, this guy come over. It was in the tank retriever, and he said, "I can't find my buddies." I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You "Get there with you." I said, "Yeah." Well, I said, "What are you doing down there anyway?" Well. We got a radio report, he said, to come down that we had to pick up a tank here. I said, well, I'll tell you. I don't know where you got that report from, but I said, do you want to take one of these taggers back with you? No, I said, <laughs> it was German tagger tanks there. He says, you got to stick around. He was, he, he was upset, this poor guy, he was really upset. He says, he come down, I can't find my buddies. And I said, well, come on down here with me. Wait for a while until things calm down a bit to know what's going on. I said, I just got here. I don't know what's going on. He went and finally, he said the last time when he left me, he says, they had the house down just about zilch down, tore down by then. The stairs, I'd try to get down the stairs in time. The upper stairwell come down and fell in the basement stairwell and just missed me and I got a big sliver in my hand, you know, my left hand. Get down there. He says, well, I'll tell you. He says, I'm going to get back into the they thanked the store. He's gonna get back in there. He says it's safer in there. Well, we fought. We got down. And I finally went up there with the colonel, and they got to get the the work done on with the liaison, the infantry. And then by the time that was getting long story evening, I says, well, we better get out of here and see. He had he had a still had to make another mission. It wasn't done yet. And, the jeep, I, I didn't know if the jeep would run, I knew to do it, was, it was hit with shrapnel or something, you know. But I guess it was a few holes on it, but it wasn't damaged, it started up, you know, and then his bedroll was sticking up on the back of the thing. And uh, so we took off and it got dark on us and we finally got a house and we got in the basement and, you know, Colonel, he got, he was unrolling his, uh, unrolling his sleeping bag and he looked and he said, well, I'll tell you something, Walko, he says, it looks like the rats got in this and chewed this all the heck of shrapnel and all coming through there. He said, but it didn't do any damage. And he pulled out a bottle of Scotch whiskey. <laughs> and uh, he says, you want to swallow? You want to drink of this? Walk over. I said, well, I don't know if I can take that. Or not. That's a little bit too strong for me, that stuff. I didn't like it anyway. You know, and he drank some. We had to, I don't remember, we had to, you know, finally made it back to the, Regimental headquarters, uh, we, and then we. There was always something to do. And, but he was a good colonel, and then. He he got promoted. To, uh, he was a lieutenant colonel. And he got promoted to a, to a full colonel. And uh, he got transferred to. The Ninth Infantry Division is chief of staff of the Ninth Infantry Division down in, in the Hurricane Forest, further south of us. But uh, well, I had got into a scrape between that from myself, and I was back because they got shot my jeep off from under me, and and I was back at the waiting for another jeep to get back to my outfit. So he, he told me to stay there and rest up for a couple of days. And I did. And then he come by, and was just as I was starting back with a new Jeep, and I had to change Jeeps, and he wanted me to go, to go with him down in Belgium. And so I climbed, and we, just, and we had a, he was a prince of a guy, you know. Okay. I liked those guys. Oh, well, he'd, he'd teach you with a lot of respect, and I treated him with respect, too, you know. And they weren't like no harebrained guys. They were mature, professional fighting men. And boy, I'll tell you, we could have never got any better ones. <laughs>